Now please turn in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs as we continue working through this book of wisdom. We are to chapter 29, so we're, we're making our way to the end. I think we're going to make it. Let's keep plugging away here. As our good friend Carl Wells used to say, just gumming it to death. Uh, just keep chewing away and we'll get there. Uh, we're going to look at the first 15 chap- uh, verses of the chapter. Again, this is a section uh, of Proverbs uh, coll- uh, by, by Solomon that was collected by Hezekiah's men. So they particularly deal uh, with leadership, uh, with societal issues. Uh, last week we looked at the concept of an ideal society. Today we're looking at uh, the high cost of foolishness. Verses 1 to 15, this is the word of God. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Whoever loves wisdom makes his father rejoice, but a companion of harlots wastes his wealth. The king establishes the land by justice, but he who receives bribes overthrows it. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. By transgression, an evil man is snared, but the righteous sings and rejoices. The righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. Scoffers set a city aflame, but wise men turn away wrath. If a wise man contends with a foolish man, whether the fool rages or laughs, there is no peace. The bloodthirsty hate the blameless but the upright seek his well-being. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. If a ruler pays attention to lies, all his servants become wicked. The poor man and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. The king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself Bring shame to his mother. And there will end the reading of God's word. May God bless his word to it, to us as we consider it together this morning. Well, I'm sure you've heard in the last uh, few weeks, if not before that, that uh, this is the most important election um, in our lifetime, or maybe the most important election in history. And um, I have to wonder what we would be thinking if we were living during the Civil War or uh, either of the World Wars or in times when our entire uh, social welfare programs were reoriented and things like that. It's, it's probably a bit hyperbolic to say that this is uh, the most important lex- uh, election in our history. But the fact does remain that it is a consequential election. Uh, There are challenges to our institutions that have been voiced uh, by contestants in these races. We've uh, had suggestions that we should add justices to the Supreme Court, that we should add states to the union, that we should abolish the Electoral College, um, that we should change the way the U.S. Senate functions. Uh, We've seen uh, great pressure and great um, critique of our law enforcement agencies. We've seen um, suggestions that we need to move away from the type of energy that we use. So there's a lot of ramifications, and that doesn't even begin to get at some of the cultural issues that are in play and the issues of religious freedom. Uh, There's a push for something that's called the Equality Act, uh, which would, uh, in in essence, end conscience protections uh, for Uh, religious groups. It would make it very difficult for Christian schools and other Christian institutions to, for example, control who they hire uh, for their positions. Uh, There's been a suggestion that the Hyde Amendment needs to be uh, revoked, and this is what prevents public funds from being spent to to support and perform abortions. And so we could go on and on. There are consequential issues at play in the election. And and for that reason, we should, as Christians who are also citizens, engage our brains, study the issues, be in prayer, and vote. Our um, 
our testimony, I put this in your outline, uh, is, uh, mentions this in our testimony on this, uh, the chapter on the civil magistrate is chapter 23. And paragraph 15 says, the Christian, when such action involves no disloyalty to Christ, ought to be involved in the selection of and to vote for civil rulers who fear God, love truth and justice, hate evil, and are publicly committed to scriptural principles of civil government. And I think it's clear from our testimony that we pray, that we labor for what we would consider ideal government, government which is expressly committed to Christian and biblical principles and which honors the Lord. And even as we pray and we labor toward that perfect end, we realize we live in an imperfect world in which um, we may vote for people that we think are moving us toward that end, even if unperfectly, and certainly not voting for people who we think are moving us away from that end and uh, trying to uh, move us farther from the ideal. So it is important that we, that we participate to the extent that our conscience allows us to do that as informed citizens. But it's also true that we need to understand that as consequential as the election is, uh, the Bible says there are other things far more consequential. And in our text today, we have something that would address the, the decisions you are making on a daily basis in your life. And, and what the passage does is warn us of the severe consequences of foolishness as it's manifested in the decisions we make and the interactions that we have with others. And so uh, although the election is important, it's nowhere near as important as the way you live in fellowship with God each and every day of your life. And so the title of this message is called High Stakes. That is because in the passage we're dealing with something of great consequence and of great importance. And the main point I hope you see as we look at the passage is that the cost of foolishness is higher than you can possibly imagine. The cost of foolishness is higher than you can possibly imagine. So we're encouraged from this passage to rather choose wisdom and life and joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And children, if you want to draw a picture of this this morning, you might draw a picture of you and one of your friends singing even when you're maybe in a difficult situation. And then you'll need to listen uh, for what uh, our passage tells us about our ability to sing when things might be difficult. Well, if you'd like to follow along in the outline, the first thing I want us to notice is the cost of foolishness is higher than you can possibly imagine. Verse 1 of our text has been called the center line of chapters 28 and 29, uh, which, again, really focus in on leadership and on societal concerns. And verse 1 says, He who is often rebuked and hardens or stiffens his neck will suddenly be destroyed and without remedy. One commentator says this verse colors the sort of tenor, tenor of the entire section because it warns against being a person who doesn't listen and doesn't answer uh, to rebuke. Now notice uh, there is a warning here. Th this person that's described as someone who's often rebuked and yet stiffens or hardens his neck. And you could picture um, a young child perhaps who is uh, being uh, corrected by a parent and that child sticks out his jaw in defiance, right? And, and says, uh, you haven't taught me anything. You think that hurt, right? Uh, and we've seen that. I know we've seen that even in our perfectly sanctified children in this congregation. We've seen something like that. And that's, that's, a, that's not a good attitude to be in. The second half of the verse says, he will be destroyed and that without remedy, uh, the idea here is no healing, there's no solution, there's, there's no way back. There comes a point at which there's no way back from foolishness. It's going to lead to destruction and no remedy at all. You know, in our current context, it, it, we're in an amazing societal situation here with the pandemic that we're in. I looked on the CDC's website. And the CDC, for, for estimation purposes, has what it calls the uh, infection fatality rate or ratio. 
And that number on average, it's different for different ages, is, is about 0.2%, which means that 99.8% of people who get sick are not going to die. That's what, that's what the official numbers are. And, and if we had at the beginning said, this is the disease we're facing, one in which 99.8% of people don't die, we would never have thought the way to deal with that is to close the whole society down and everybody hide in your house and nobody do anything. Right, well, what's different about this disease is there's no treatment, there's no vaccine. And so that lends this uh, element of fear. There's nothing that can be done. And if, I, and if I'm one of the susceptible people who gets it, you can't save me. Now, we could argue there's lots of things in life that this is true for, right? But uh, just grant for a moment that this is sort of unique, that there is no vaccination, there is no cure at this point for this disease. And you see how that brings a level of fear. Well, this text is telling us that foolishness leads to a destruction from which there is no cure, for which there is no cure. That if we are going to live uh, in foolishness, we're in a condition where at some point, if we die in our foolishness, there's no remedy, there's no way out. And, and my guess is we're not nearly as afraid of foolishness as we are of uh, the coronavirus right now. But the scripture's telling us we should be. We should be. Because the, the idea of destruction here has with it an eternal sense. And it's implied that this is something that comes from God. It's a way to talk about judgment. So we have eternal consequences at play. I guarantee you this. The coronavirus cannot send a person to eternal judgment, right, on its own. It can take you out of this world at a worst case scenario, but it cannot send you to hell. But foolishness can. Foolishness can. And so there's something uh, very significant here. The stakes are very, very high. And so we need to ask ourselves, have, have we been people who have been often rebuked but not listened? Who, who are the people that rebuke us? Well, we would hear from our parents, wouldn't we, children, and maybe our grandparents. And uh, in a sense, we hear uh, from our ministers when they're through the preaching of the word. And, and we hear from our friends sometimes. And, and people may be speaking into your life, uh, encouraging you to turn away from some area of foolishness in your life. Don't be stiff-necked. Don't be stubborn. You realize that's the description uh, that Stephen used for the, the Old Testament Israelites, the people then who were rejecting Jesus. He said, you're a stiff-necked people. And what was their response to that? They rushed out and killed Stephen for saying that to them. So th th there's a point in which our foolishness drives us to a type of stubbornness. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 29 and 30, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. And Jesus was using there the word Gehenna, which was the trash dump outside of Jerusalem where there was a perpetual fire, perpetual degrada degradation. He later says, uh, talk about the worm that does not die and the fire that is not quenched. That's a picture of the judgment that awaits for the foolish. And each one of us is going to face a reckoning and a day in which it will be too late. So recognize the cost of foolishness is higher than you can possibly imagine. Secondly, we see in these verses that your foolishness or your wisdom, on the other hand, will impact other people. So one of the things that makes foolishness so dangerous is that it always flows out from us toward others. It's, it's another positive aspect of wisdom that flows out towards others. But foolishness is not a victimless crime. Verse 2 gets at an idea we looked at last week. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. If there is righteous leadership, it is a blessing to the rest of society. A righteous leadership can raise an entire nation. That's an encouragement. But the other side of that, second half of verse 2, when a wicked man rules, 
the nation groans. A corrupt leader can cause suffering for the entire people. I don't know if you follow at all what's happened in the nation of Venezuela. Venezuela, a few decades ago, was the wealthiest country in South America and one of the wealthiest in the world. They have plentiful oil reserves. And in the last several decades, they've gone from being one of the wealthiest places, certainly in South America, but in the whole world, to one of the poorest. And now people are literally starving and they don't have the basic necessities. And a lot of this is driven by corrupt politicians. The first thing they did was nationalize the oil industry. So the government took over the resources. And then from there, it's been a downward spiral that has caused millions of people to flee from that country. And this has happened very rapidly. A corrupt leader can cause tremendous problems. Verse four, the king establishes the land by justice, but he who receives bribes overthrows it. Again, the idea that uh, righteous leadership brings stability, right? Justice brings stability and peace to a nation. But someone who's on the take, someone who's receiving bribes, someone who's looking to enrich himself or herself through his office or her office brings uh, trouble, as it says, uh, actually brings the overthrow of the government. It brings the, uh, the society into disrepair and tears it down. Verse seven, the righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. Again, this idea of a concern for the needy and a care for the needy versus those who just ignore or pretend they don't see problems. And then verse 12, if a ruler pays attention to lies, all his servants become wicked. That's sort of just a truism, isn't it? If you're creating a culture that, that says, you know, lie to me, that's what I want, what's going to happen, right? That the people who report to you, this guy only wants to hear what he wants to hear, or he only wants to hear a good report, or whatever it is, I'm just going to tell him what he wants to hear, and that creates a culture that is very unhealthy. And in all of these verses we've just looked at, what you're seeing is the corporate effects of foolishness. It, it goes out, it affects other people. I was reading uh, just recently about the, uh, the situation in, in, in Chicago, and this is true in a lot of major cities where the, the restaurant industry has been just decimated by uh, the, the virus and the response to the virus. And the governor of Illinois has just said, uh, we're going to close down the restaurants again. And so some of the restaurant owners have basically said, uh, well, we're just not doing that. I mean, we're going to take every precaution we can, but we will go out of business. We can't just close down and not have business. And so they've decided whether it's fines uh, from the state or it's just simply going out of business, they're going to risk it and, uh, and try to keep their doors open. And, 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 and this, is, this is the kind of thing that happens when the government or the leadership is foolish and the people suffer. They groan in response to that. But it's not just true in politics. It's true in other organizations. It's certainly true in families. So the, the father, the parents, as they create a culture in a family, is that a culture that tends toward wisdom and righteousness, or is it a culture that lends toward foolishness? Is the culture in your family one in which there's trust, where a child who's struggling with something feels like he or she can talk to his or her parents honestly and openly without being condemned, right? That, they're, that, that, that the kids have questions. They need to feel safe. They need to feel that there's trust, even if we don't condone something that our kids think is a great idea, but we deal with them in love. There's, there's a culture there. Is there stability there? This is the kind of thing that we can have a tremendous impact on our families and on those around us. And so, and so foolishness or wisdom has corporate effects. And this is one of the reasons why the stakes are so high. Thirdly, uh, this text shows us that wisdom is the way to life and to joy. And uh, verses 3 and 15 sort of act as a, as a nice frame for most of this passage, because in verse 3 it talks about wisdom and a father. In verse 15 it talks about wisdom 
and the mother. And some commentators think that 15 is sort of just the completion of the thought in verse 3. It's a rare verse where the mother is mentioned by herself, uh, sort of paired with verse 3. And verse 3 tells us, uh, whoever loves wisdom makes his father rejoice, but a companion of harlots wastes his wealth. What an encouraging thing. A wise child makes the father rejoice. If you want to bring joy to your parents, children, be wise. And the way you be wise is to love and serve Jesus Christ. Loving and serving Jesus Christ is the ultimate definition of wisdom. And if you want to make your parents rejoice, you should do that. You should do that. Verse 15 talks about how we learn this wisdom. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. This reminds us we need to be taught. We all need to be taught. So um, this, um, this, this mention of the rod is, is a reference to discipline. This is sort of a figure for discipline. And we've talked before that, uh, that there is a place for corporal punishment if that's done in love, if it's done in a consistent way. Uh, but that in itself isn't enough. That there, there's, there's a training that goes in. And as it says in the second half of verse 15, a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. We just let the garden grow how it wants to grow naturally, right? The, the, the undisciplined garden, is we have a, a word for that. It's a weed patch, right? It's not actually a garden at all. And so we recognize there needs to be input. And discipline is, is hard work. It's difficult for parents and for children. But we recognize how valuable it is. Ephesians 6 verse 4 is the New Testament version of this. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training. Or you could in, uh, translate that word discipline and admonition of the Lord. And uh, recognize if, if, if we fail to learn wisdom, we actually can bring great pain to our parents. Uh, children, that's in there in verse 15. Uh, if we're not wise, if we don't love and serve God, that will bring pain to our parents. And certainly I know you don't want to do that. Verse 6, by transgression, an evil man is snared, but the righteous sings and rejoices. What happens when we give way to our sin, to, to our foolishness, is that it's like a net that's set as a trap for us, and it catches us. Eventually, it catches up to us, and there's suffering that, um, that happens as a result. But what happens to the person who is faithful and walks with the Lord? It says in the second half of that verse, the righteous sings and rejoices. And, and this is implying that in all circumstances, not just when things are good, there is a way in which we are able to rejoice and to be with a song in our heart, even in difficult times. That's something that comes as a gift from God through the wisdom of Christ. I saw an interesting story last week that Tim Challies had linked to. It was uh, about the uh, longtime locker room attendant of the Edmonton Oilers. All right, so professional hockey team that had their heyday in the 1980s when they won four Stanley Cups in the years of Wayne Gretzky. And this locker room attendant, a man named Joey Moss, had been recommended by Wayne Gretzky uh, for a job with the organization. And so he started working uh, in the early 80s. And uh, he just died uh, about a week ago. And tributes were pouring in uh, all over for this man who ha had simply served as the locker room attendant. Uh, Gretzky said that uh, this guy was so committed to his job that there would be times when there'd be a late a game and a late interview, and if it was time for the locker room to be swept, then this guy would just vacuum over top of everybody's shoes. Uh, he, he was just going to do his job. But his exuberance and his joyfulness is what impacted so many people. So much so that the organization let him sing the national anthem before a game one time. And I listened to it. It's not because he's a great singer, but it was because of his tremendous exuberance. And what was so unique about Joey was that he was born with Down syndrome. 
And Wayne Gretzky had gotten him that job, and he'd been in it for almost 40 years until he died, faithfully and joyfully doing his work. Uh, So much so, again, that they're talking about putting a statue of him outside the arena with the other Hall of Fame uh, players from their organization. But this is what verse 6 is talking about, having a song in our heart that transcends our situation in this world. That's something that the wisdom of Christ can give you that nothing else can. Wisdom is a way to life and joy. Fourthly, we see here that foolishness is the way to conflict and suffering. Verse 5 shows us one of the foolish ways to interact with other people. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. Flattery, giving insincere compliments is a way, and it's not clear in the verse, is that a way to lay a trap for the person you're flattering, or is that a way to lay a trap for yourself? And probably both uh, could be true and are in view here. And we ought to not be people who give insincere compliments to others because we hope that we'll get something out of it. We also ought to not be people who want to hear uh, compliments, even if they're insincere, uh, because uh, we are insecure or something like that. I thank God regularly that I have a wife who will tell me the truth. And if you have a spouse who will tell you the truth, you have a precious gift indeed. We don't need flatterers. Verse 8, scoffers set a city aflame, but wise men turn away wrath. Uh, The word there, uh, scoffers, is synonymous with the ungodly. Uh, Psalm 1, 1 talks about this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor seats in the sits in the seat of the scornful. And that's the same word there for mockers or scoffers. And uh, what do these people do in positions of leadership? It says they set a city aflame. Some translations say they stir up trouble. They agitate the whole city. It's fascinating that we're living in an age in which we are literally seeing cities set on fire largely because of foolish leadership where the mayor tells the police chief uh, to get the police to stand down and the police stand down. And then what starts out perhaps as a legitimate protest turns into a riot where people are burning and looting and pillaging and destroying. And we've seen that repeated. It's going on even in the last week in Philadelphia. The contrast to this in the second half of verse eight, the wise men uh, turn away wrath. These these religious leaders who go into the community and bring calm and try to uh, stop the violence, that's what's in view here, and and good leadership can do that. Verse 11, a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Uh, You could translate this sort of gives full full expression to his rage. And uh, sadly, some people think that um, losing your temper is sort of a sign of strength. But losing your temper in the Bible is not a sign of strength. It's a sign of weakness. And someone who gives full vent to his or her emotions is doing something very bad, something that is foolish. And in contrast, someone who is wise is able to control his or her emotions and, again, bring peace and stability to a situation. Verse 9 refers to the fact that you can't win an argument with a fool. Either uh, he rages or he laughs at you. And so uh, either way, it's unpleasant if you're going to interact with foolish people. Verse 10, the bloodthirsty hate the blameless, but the upright seek his well-being. You then get this idea that the fool has uh, uh, anger and hatred toward Uh, the righteous and toward those who would seek to follow God. And so again, all of this is pointing to the fact that foolishness inherently promotes conflict and suffering. Um, African-American historian Shelby Steele has just produced 
a video called, or a movie, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably an hour and a half long movie, What Killed Michael Brown. Uh, Michael Brown was an um, African-American young man who was shot by a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. Shelby Steele, who's African-American, and his son Eli made the movie with him. And Shelby Steele is probably the preeminent historian of race in our country. Uh, and, and it's worth watching. So, you know, I'm not going to spoil it. Um, but he makes a pretty powerful and compelling argument uh, that uh, the narrative that we have been told uh, or that came out of that event isn't really what happened. And he interviews a lot of people who were there, who are eyewitnesses, and who have lived in the community prior and after this event. And what he does is make a fascinating case that a lot of the problems in Ferguson and in other areas are the consequence of a series of foolish decisions made back since the 1960s. And he documents this fairly well. And it's, it's pretty powerful to see how foolish decisions we make that get worked into our society lead to situations that promote crime and despair and all kinds of other things. And we have to recognize foolishness causes damage. It just does. And whether that's at the societal level or whether that's at the family level or whether that's even at the level of a church or a religious community. And you, need, you and I need to think about this ourselves. If we are the kind of people that give full vent to our emotions, there is no doubt we are causing problems. We are causing some form of suffering and conflict in the groups of which we are a part. And this warns us against that. That's the road of foolishness. It brings conflict and it brings suffering. But finally, we're encouraged in this passage to choose wisdom, life, and joy under the reign of King Jesus. Verse 13, the poor man and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. Isn't that interesting? So even as we think about characteristics of the foolish and the wise, the weak and the strong, this reminds us that, that it's all under God's authority, that we're all made in the image of God with certain dignity and value because of God. And, and it reminds us that God is over all and that we are under him. And, and this should give us encouragement that there is dignity and there is value and there is hope for, for people because of God and because of this fact. And verse 14 says, the king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. Here is a king, a king who judges the poor, the weak, the needy that we've been talking about in truth. He's the one that has an eternal kingdom. Commentator Derek Kidner says, the test of a man in power and his hidden strength is the extent to which he keeps faith with those who can put least pressure on him. We have such a king, a king who cannot be pressured, a king who loves and ministers to those who have absolutely nothing to offer him. This is what we desperately need because we are all infected with the virus of foolishness. And it comes out in all kinds of different ways. And yet G King Jesus, he is the one who comes ruling in truth. And he is the one that has an eternal kingdom. Psalm 72 verse 4, which we're going to sing after the sermon, says he will bring about Jesus. He will bring justice to the poor people. He will save the children of the needy and he will break in pieces the oppressor. This is the Lord who came from heaven to live a life of wisdom in our world. A, one who, a man who learned as he should have as he grew up. A man who taught perfectly. A man who had his emotions under control at all time. A man who promoted peace and joy and life. And the king who has an eternal reign. 
Jesus is the only king who rules forever, and there is no other. And because of his life and death and resurrection and ascension, he governs all things. And he is our hope for wisdom. It's not about you and me trying harder to be wise. It's about you and me seeking the Lord Jesus Christ and living in fellowship with him and the grace that he gives us to live wisely and to forsake foolishness, to embrace joy and life and the wisdom that he offers. Yes, there is a lot at stake in the election but no matter who wins the election at any level, right? and if your conscience won't allow you to vote in a particular race, vote in the races where you can vote. But no matter what happens, next Wednesday, Jesus Christ is still on his throne. That won't change a bit. And he'll still be the source of perfect wisdom, the source of life, and the source of joy for all of his people. The cost of foolishness is higher than you can possibly imagine. But choose life, choose joy, choose wisdom in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is himself the embodiment of the wisdom of God. Let's pray and we'll ask him to do that. Heavenly Father, we praise your name as the author of all truth. We thank you that you are the one who gives light to the eyes. You are the one who enables us to see. And we pray for your spirit's work in our own hearts. Lord, help us to recognize where we have been foolish, even in this last week. Lord, if there are any among us who have never come to know you personally through Jesus Christ, help us to realize the peril that we're in. Help us to realize how serious a problem foolishness is, that it's something that has eternal consequences. Lord, we pray that you would give us grace and that by the grace of Christ, we would be able to pursue wisdom because Jesus is the source of all wisdom. And Lord, that we would find that joy and life that comes through knowing him and through living in this world, that you would give us a song in our heart that we could sing even in the most difficult times. We could be like Saul, uh, Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi, locked and chained after being beat, yet singing praise to you. That is a gift of your grace, and we pray for that. We pray for that spirit to be at work in our hearts. Lord, we do pray for our nation, that you would deliver us from evil and from division and from foolishness in all its different forms, and that you would guide us through this election and that you would bring us closer to yourself. But we pray, Lord, that no matter what happens, we as your people would walk faithfully with you and that you would be pleased to use us as you bring about the accomplishment of your perfect will and your perfect plans. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we'll sing back in praise to the Lord from Psalm 72, Selection E. This is the psalm that speaks about Christ as the great king who will save the needy when they call, who will establish justice and righteousness, who will have a universal reign that goes from sea to sea and covers the whole world. We, uh, we look forward uh, to Jesus ushering in his kingdom more and more and coming in his power. So let's stand and we'll sing Psalm 72, Selection E. Mm -hmm. 